Hi everyone, Marsha here. I am making a video for this week's discussion post. One of my professional goals is to have a stronger digital presence, and I'm also working on creating more dynamic um, virtual instructional tools. So I wanted to practice that skill this summer. So you'll see some videos from me. Um, this week, it was really great for me to spend time focusing on the differences between engagement and empowerment. And I think that these are great tools to really help create deeper learning, which is one of the big essential questions of this course that we're taking. And in this situation, how can technology enhance teaching and learning partnerships for deeper learning? And I think that those innovative models and those strategies that we looked at this week are a really important tool to keep in mind. Um, I noticed in two of our different sources that they both referenced Bill Farader's blog and espe especially this image of engaging students versus empowering students. And for me, I really had to kind of come back to that because I'm not opposed to engaging students. I think in the traditional classroom, it is important for students to get excited about content and interests and curricula. I also understand that it's really important for students to feel empowered because we're always wondering how can we have our students learn to the best of their abilities and feel good about their learning. And that empowerment model is a really great way to do that. And so for me, I kept coming back to this. I checked out Bill Farader's blog. I have it linked in my slideshow because I think it's a really great tool for you to kind of go back to. Um, what I came up with in my head is that engagement and empowerment are kind of overlapping circles in a Venn diagram. And that as a teacher, your classroom needs to be engaging, but you have to provide opportunities to empower your learners appropriately for their age level, their skills, their interests, and the goals of the course. So it's definitely an art form, and I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all solution. But I do think that this is something that we should all be spending more time thinking about as we move forward. I really was combing the resources this week to try to understand what strategies people find successful in empowering students. And for me and my money, I thought, okay, John Spencer's blog is fabulous. And it's a great example of a teacher in real time thinking about what changes can I make to engage my students? And a bell went off for me with Schlechty's levels of engagement. So I included the visual from that because this is a tool I could use to sit down with any eighth grader and talk about in the middle of a project during a work period, where do you think you are on this chart? Are you in rebellion? Are you getting up to sharpen your pencil seven times? Are you trying to talk to the girl about the eighth grade dance at the end of the year? Or are you in strategic compliance? Are you trying really hard, but you're not really putting in the effort? Are you looking good? Are you keeping track of your notes? Are you doing what you're supposed to do, but not really into it? Or are you truly engaged? Do you have a high commitment? Are you feeling good about this? This is a tool I could use to talk to eighth graders, so I wanted to include it. Um, for me, it helped me ground my understanding because it's like, okay, engagement is not a bad thing. Engagement is still a really critical feature in empowering students. It's kind of a step along the way. You cannot empower students until they are truly engaged. Students might not be truly engaged until you give them opportunities to feel empowered. And when that bell went off, I was like, oh, <laughs> I can do that. I got it. Um, so then I kind of took my learning and made it a little more personal. I was thinking to myself, if I was designing a lesson or if I was in the middle of pitching a project with kids and I wanted to empower them, what questions would I ask them? And so I work with middle schoolers and I often start with KWL charts and I ask them, what do you want to learn? And I love those charts because they help me adjust my instruction. And so in a middle school context, students sometimes don't have the background information that they need, like they don't know what they don't know. So for a social studies classroom, I often will do a web quest and I'll do some guided notes as a way to give them a big overview or an umbrella of the curriculum. And then within that, I will say, okay, pick what you're interested in and let's explore it. And so providing the structure of what do you want to learn is helpful. And when I assign a project, every unit I do a big open-ended project with kids, is I ask them, how are you going to learn it? And students are allowed to watch YouTube videos. They could watch a documentary. 
They could read a resource. They could listen to a podcast. There's all sorts of options for them. Um, but I think the big part of how are you going to learn it is teaching metacognition skills. What are you thinking? How are you thinking about it? What are you putting things together? Like, what is your process? And for middle school students, this is where they are. They don't have the metacognition skills to independently dive into a large project right away, but they can be coached and get to a place where they can truly have empowered learning. Another important question to ask when you're working on empowering projects with students is, how will we know what we've learned? How will we know what you've learned? How are you going to show your work? And I believe strongly in frequent check-ins with middle schoolers, so we might have a project period. And during that project period, I will take my roster and I will meet with every single student, maybe for a minute, maybe for two or three, maybe 10. And those frequent check-ins are really informative because it helps me gauge where my students at socially, emotionally, and educationally. We might be organizing a binder, or we might be going through notes together, or we might be um, mitigating some issues between peers. Another important tool is peer review because students are really great at calling each other out. They're also really great at coaching each other. And then how will we know what you've learned? I think I have a PBL background, but community publishing and celebrating learning is really important. It should be a public product. Either there is an exhibition fair where we set up the projects around the room and we do a gallery walk, or maybe we are putting our information live on the internet to share with our parents, um, with privacy of course, but we have podcasts that people can listen to. But there should be some public pressure to kind of do their best work. And then their best work is what we celebrate. You don't want to get to the end of a project and be like, well, I mean, it's not great, guys. But you want to say, hey, you guys did your best. This is great. And you want to build them up because every project along the way builds those confidence skills to get to a better job at the end. Um, the last question I ask is how can we collaborate? I think the teacher is a facilitator. I've always been a facilitator as a teacher. So what do you need from me? But also, how can you work with other groups of kids? I had a great moment this year where I had three students working on their water project PBLs together and they were not friends. Two were friends and the third one was just kind of added to the group because they didn't have anyone. And there was some awkward startups, but the team realized really fast, wait a minute, this third student is really great at editing digital videos. Oh my gosh, they're an iMovie genius. And it built social skills, it built collaboration skills, and it also showed students that everybody can be an expert in something. And so those collaboration skills are really important to teach. Um, another strategy that came to mind for this week was the SAMR model. Um, this is a model I saw previously in my blended and flipped learning classes, but I think it's really important to bring it back. I do talk to my students about it because when I do choice projects with them and I'm saying, okay, you have to create something, they don't always know where to start. So they'll be like, well, can I make a slideshow? Yeah, you can substitute a poster for a slideshow. That's fine. Oh, well, what else could I do? And we start to talk about the different types of technology they could use. Middle school students need a lot of exemplars, um, but teaching them different types of technology and how to use it is a really great school, uh, tool. So I think that's another strategy we should always include. And then looking at the ITSE standards, I think that the ITSE standards have done a great job adapting to a more empowered student-centered learning model. I really liked the quote of when empowered students can engage in deep learning that supports long-term academic success and true learning um, instead of master, uh, memorization and mastery of learning objectives. So basically, I'm just thinking in my head here, when students are empowered, they show mastery in their own way. It's not a checklist. It's not something that's black and white. It's individualized, and I think that's great. As a middle school teacher, I love this image because it's a wheel, and I think that some lessons might focus more closely on digital citizenship because I'm constantly combating plagiarism. Um, it might also take a move into creative communicator where maybe we're all making an infographic about different things, but I'm teaching those skills of how to make an infographic and we're dabbling in design as well. So this is a great foothold for empowering students. I don't specifically assess these skills because I don't report on them for our report cards, but I do consider them in my planning. 
um, three examples of projects that I do or would like to do to help empower my students um, are shared here on the slideshow. You can go ahead and click and check them all out. Um, the first project I do is the water project. And the water project is a project-based learning activity the whole grade participates in. And I teach the history of water management in ancient and modern India. We talk about water quality, access, as well as waste management. And this is a really important project because kids then pick another region and they research and present their findings on it. Um, in the years past, we required a podcast. And then this past year, we eased up and we let them choose their own path. And that was really successful. We still had a lot of podcasts, but I also had some great videos and websites. Um, Another project I am familiar with and I was excited to see was the Greek gene, uh, the Genius Hour. I've designed a Greek inspired Genius Hour where I teach about the ancient Greek philosophers and all the accomplishments of Greek civilization. And then I turn the mic over to students and I ask them, well, what are you passionate about? What could you invent or explore or learn more about? I wasn't able to implement it in the past two years because we have a sculpture base that we do. But I'm really hopeful to bring it back for next year because I think that that's a little bit more student-centered and appropriate for eighth graders. And then for every unit, I do have a content choice project. I have a link to our China research project. And so I follow a similar structure with every unit. We do visual vocabulary, we do mapping, we do a web quest, we build the background knowledge. And then I ask students to make an artifact of their choosing. And this is really important for students because it helps them to develop some um, skills around making choices, which in middle school is a really important skill. And the most important piece of that is for every single project, I use um, a single point rubric. And a single point rubric, if you're not using one, is a time saver. You just put your learning target in the proficient column. But for students, this is a great tool for them to use during and after the project. And so they might look at someone else's project, they could provide feedback for their peer and give them the feedback to what they could improve before they finish the project. Um, but it's a really clear and consistent way to give feedback because that's another strategy you should have um, as a routine in your classroom so students know how you're going to give them feedback. They know how to make sense of it and then they know how to act on it. So um, this week, I really enjoyed looking at empowerment and engagement. I think that you should kind of have a foot in both because your students need for you to be able to do so. Um, I think really powerful learning can take place with empowerment. But in the eighth grade middle school classroom, we are building a lot of competencies and skills and confidence around choice making. And so providing them the opportunity and then coaching them through it is critical. And then here's my references. Thanks for listening.